Shall we kick it off? All right, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, what AU undergraduate students wish faculty and staff knew. Um, Jessica and I are joined by uh, a number of really wonderful AU students and, uh, and look forward to having them sort of share some of their experiences um, with all of you. Um, I know we are still having a couple of folks try to join and so um, we can do some quick introductions, um, but we may also add in a couple of, of panelists as we go. So my name is Regina Curran, uh, she or they pronouns. I currently serve as the interim assistant vice president for student engagement in the Office of Campus Life um, and have had the pleasure to serve in a few different roles at AU uh, since 2012. So glad to be here with you all and with our students. And hey, all, I'm Jessica Waters. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Education and Vice Provost for Academic Student Services. Um, I'm also a former AU student, both um, undergrad and law. So I love this panel. And I, I, I wonder what I would have said 25 years ago if I was on this panel. Um, but we did a version of this last year um, during one of our um, wellness summits. And like, without exception, every single faculty member and staff member who attended said it was their favorite session to actually hear directly from our students. So we wanted to do it again, and we're lucky enough to be joined by um, some stellar students who are in a wide variety of schools um, across AU and have a wide variety of experiences. So we'll let them introduce themselves, um, and then we'll jump into some questions. Um, and we are happy to take questions throughout. Um, you know, in the in the chat would be probably most useful. Um, you know, but we'll we can see how it goes and see if we can do oral questions as well. So with that, um, let's see. I see Desiree on my screen. Desiree, do you want to just introduce yourself, your school, and one or two things um, about your experience at AU? Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Desert Perez. I'm originally from New York. I plan on graduating this year, so I'm a senior. Um, I'm a student in Colgard. I my I major in business administration. I minor in African American studies. Can you not hear me? We can um, hear you. Um, I currently am employed under RHA, and I am the director of operations for the Black diaspora affinity committee um yeah perfect thanks desiree um let's see i see gabby hi my name is gabby i'm a rising sophomore in the school of public affairs i'm a political science major i'm also from the area so i'm from Tumac, maryland and outside of my studies, I'm heavily involved in Hallel on campus. So last year I served as the president of the Jewish Student Association and this year I'm an intern with them. So I'm heavily involved with that outside. Thanks. Thanks, Gabby. Okay, let's see, Andrea. Hi, my name is Andrea. I'm a senior in the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm studying psychology and emotion. Um, and I've been a program leader since fall of 2020, so I've done it both online and in person. So I've had a lot of experience working with first year students um, and hearing their perspective on joining AU life and culture. Um, and I'm graduating this year, which is very exciting. So <laughs> very excited for that. Yay, graduating. Okay. Um, we do have two additional students joining us, but um, I, I, I think I was not the only one having trouble getting in on the Zoom link. So. Um, we have a student, um, Ashan, and a student, Stevie, um, who we hope will join us momentarily. We'll introduce them when they come in. Um, so why don't we start off, very first question, sort of a softball, but to get us going. Um, if each of the three of you could tell us, oh, and I see Stevie entering. Why don't we let Stevie enter and then we'll jump in. Stevie, you're here. Yep, connect into audio. Hey, Stevie. <laughs> Oh. Stevie, it sounds like you're having some audio issues. You might need to log in again. Okay. Okay, so, hold on. Okay. All right. So let's see. For um, Andrea, Gabby, and Desiree, um, first question. Tell us like, one thing you love about AU and one thing that if you could change, you could. And we'll start with, um, why don't we start with Desiree? I love the opportunities that are available at AU. I feel like a lot of alumni do come 
bad and like have a connection with the students. Um, or at least that's what I've seen from the black side of alumni working with the the um the group that I'm under. Uh the thing that I don't like about AU is like kind of the hardworking culture. I feel like it gives a lot of kids anxiety. And I think that if we could have if we could be encouraged to have more of a work life balance, that would be very helpful. So the the wonk culture, Desiree, is that we're getting at? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you have to have like done 27 internships and saved a small country by the time you graduate. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Okay. Um, Gabby, how about you? One thing that I've been really happy with at AU is kind of the different breadth of classes that I'm able to take, especially just being a first year going into my second year. There have been a bunch of different classes that I didn't even know I was going to be able to take, and I find them really interesting. And a lot of the ones, at least in the School of Public Affairs, I can tell that the teachers are really interested in the material that they're teaching. They don't feel like they're just putting up a PowerPoint and just reading it off for you. They really seem to care about the topics and the students that they're teaching. Um, one thing that I would say I've struggled with has kind of been figuring out what courses to take. I feel like I wish that my advisor, both in my first year and then going into my upper class years, had been more. Um, not almost transparent with me and been able to form a better connection because I feel like I'm still unsure about what classes I need to be taking and what the trajectory of my major is going to look like. And I feel like I found more support, which has been great in my TAs or my peer facilitators or just upperclassmen, which is great. But I wish that I had had more support from my um, advisors earlier on. Okay, so helping with that four year plan and seeing how it all all connects is that yeah year? and yeah okay makes good sense okay um, Andrea how about you. So I would agree with Gabby that some of my favorite parts about AU have been the classes that i've taken um, and meeting professors from all different types of fields and taking classes that I wasn't exactly planning on learning about um, which kind of like made me change my major and maybe learn new things about myself that I wouldn't have known before starting school. Um, and then similar to Desiree, that kind of wonk culture is probably one of my least favorite parts about AU. And while I respect the hustle, it would be nice to see people who are kind of trying to take it slow and um, enjoy their experience in college rather than trying to push forward and uh, one up people and uh, get like 10 internships per semester or whatever. Um, and instead just try to take it slow, focus on their classes. So, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot about or hearing a lot about um, is, is hustle a good word or a dirty word, right? And I hear you echoing some of that. Yeah, yeah, makes good sense. Um, and we have our two other panelists have joined. Um, so Ashan, um, if you could just introduce yourself, your school, your year, and then one thing you love about AU and one thing you would change. Sure. So I'm Ishan Vasisht. I'm a rising senior in Kogod. Um, one thing I love about AU is I feel like, um, especially um, comparatively, uh, a lot of my friends during uh, COVID had a lot of trouble transitioning to online classes. And I feel like AU, um, it was one of the uh, smoothest transitions that I, I did not expect it to go that well. Um, I feel like uh, all my professors were very, uh, very good about staying in touch, making sure everyone was doing well during COVID. Um, and I think that was that was great for me. Um, the uh, one one thing I think could be uh, improved, um, it's been touched on a few times, but I think um, just the pressure from um, Wong culture, I felt like when I came into the school, I needed to have three internships already. And then uh, I needed to be doing uh, internships or work every semester in, in addition to my classes. So I think um, just adjusting expectations uh, would be would be something that that could be improved. Great, thanks, Ashan. Um, and I've been fortunate. Ashan works um, in our office and has for a couple of years, so um, I, I've seen that work ethic um, in, in play. Um, Stevie also works in my office. Um, Stevie, so your um, your school, your year, and one thing you love about AU, and one thing you would change. Can you hear me right now? We can. OK, so um, I'm in SPA. Um, you said my year 2024 is when I plan to graduate. 
Um, and one thing I like about AU, I would say that I actually really like the faculty. It's actually probably my favorite thing about AU. Um, like genuinely, I typically have a pretty good relationship with faculty and staff. They're usually really help, uh, helpful as long as you come also with like a happy sort of attitude, even if you don't, but like still. Um, and then something that I wish that I could change, I wish people cared, specifically students, but in general, I wish people cared more about teamwork. I feel like even when it comes to having teams, people feel like there needs to be like a leader or a person in charge or a person getting the credit. But it's like working together is about working together. Like we're supposed to literally put our all in and produce together and we all should be able to, you know, get credit, all those things. So like even in classes when there's projects or taking notes, I feel like those should be more teamwork oriented. Yeah, actually, I had a um, someone comment to me a couple of weeks ago that AU tends to have a very individualistic culture um, that, you know, students are working on their own stuff and they've got their own internship and, you know, the things that they're doing outside of AU rather than that more community culture. So that that makes sense. OK, um, I think Regina is going to throw out our next question, but everyone feel free to be putting questions in the chat um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Regina. Awesome. Thank you all so much. So. Um, something we we sort of discussed a little bit amongst ourselves, but can you all share something that a faculty member could do in the first several weeks of class that you would find particularly helpful um, as a student? And I don't wanna necessarily have to go around to everyone, so give me some sort of sign if you wanna jump in. Yeah, Stevie. Something that um, I think that faculty members should sort of make really clearly in the beginning of class is that like you, even if you don't like questions, make it clear that you're open to questions because I think that a lot of times we are being taught something and something might just totally go over our head or we misheard something and we want to ask, but if we feel like we're being a bother, we don't want to ask and then we're missing an entire section of what we're supposed to learn. Um, and so like just, even if you're like, if you are confused, if I said something that doesn't make sense, if you feel like you heard something else, just ask, or you can ask in the middle of class, because there have been times where people have asked something in the middle of class and it helped the entire class. Sure, thank you, Stevie. Yeah, Stevie, on that note, like what, what, it, what happens that makes you feel like you're a bother, right? Are there, are there certain ways that faculty or a staff member might respond that you would have that sense? Yeah, so sometimes a professor will just be like, I can go over that, like, a different class I don't feel like it right now sometimes they'll literally say they don't feel like it um sometimes they just kind of go like <sighs> before they answer or they'll like sort of make it like a class issue where they'll be like does anybody else have this question or is this just like a Stevie question and it's like well why does it matter just answer the question oh. yikes yeah I wouldn't want to ask a question either <laughs> okay thanks for sharing that Stevie yeah Andrea uh, I think that community building in the first couple of weeks of class is very helpful because um, oftentimes I feel like students go into class on the first day and they just kind of like sit on their own. They're ready to work, ready to just get the class done. But by opening up um, the class that they're talking to their individual selves as well as their students is very helpful because if you have a question and you're not 100% comfortable going to the professor just yet, you can turn to one of uh, your classmates and you can ask them for help. Or if there is an assignment um, that you can work on in groups, it's helpful to already know the students in the class, um, as well as just like being more comfortable sharing something during class. Because um, students who are maybe a little more on the shy side might not feel comfortable raising their hand if they feel like they don't know a single person in the class, especially, especially for like the very large lectures. So knowing even at least like five people in the class can make a huge difference in making them more comfortable in the long run. Awesome. Thank you. I think that goes right back to what we were talking about with the individualistic culture, right? And having to be really intentional about helping to build some community and some culture in class. Thanks, Andrea. Um, who else? Any, anyone else want to share on this particular topic? Yeah, Desiree. I think um, just being encouraging and assuring us that we're all here to succeed and like grades do matter, but the content also matters a lot more. 
um, to kind of alleviate that pressure, like just to reassure that the professor is there to help us. Um, if we have any questions, like Stevie said, to make us feel comfortable enough to come to them, or if not, to give other resources like TAs or um, the writing center or the math center in case some people are really shy and don't want to go to their professor or the TA. And then to bring in Andrea's point to, to build that community within the students so that if we don't want to go to any of those resources, we could at least go to another fellow student and ask them what are they thinking or what did they learn yeah. and how they can help us. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think something that uh, we sort of talked about before that might be helpful to build on is, um, have you all noticed any particularly effective ways to use TAs uh, in class that you felt was like particularly helpful to you as a student? Yeah, that's right. Their office hours are very helpful is what I learned. Yeah. Okay, great. So emphasizing that. Stevie? TAs have also been really good where even if you're just like, I'm having problems with this teaching style, can we just like talk a little bit on the side? They're usually like, yeah, because usually they don't teach identical to the professor. So that's always been really helpful with TAs in my experience. Awesome. Awesome. And so faculty can maybe emphasize some of those things um, about the role of a TA when uh, people talk about it. Great. Ashan. Yeah, so I'm actually also, I've, I was a TA for a semester. Uh, and during that, I think the, at least what I felt was most effective was the office hours, since students could ask questions that um, they might not have felt like they could ask in class. Um, and we were able to go over it on a more individual level. And I think that was, that was really helpful for a lot of people. Stevie, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I'll be, I just was, I wasn't specific enough with the whole TAs teaching different. I've had professors who, if they didn't know how to reiterate a question so somebody could understand, they'll be like, to a TA, they'll say, can you come up with a different idea? And that's like helpful to the class. Great, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Jessica, you got our next question. Yeah, so um, I've heard a lot about community. Right. Um, and some people and the idea of forming community in the classroom or forming it in other places. How do you all form community outside of the classroom? Like where, where do you find those spaces? How do you form that community? Um, or if it's if it's a challenge, what's the challenge? So I'd love to hear more about that outside of the classroom experience as well. Gabby. I think one way that was really good for me last year was being in a living learning community or like the university college. And it kind of, it was more helpful even to have the class than to just live with everyone. But the fact that we were all taking a class that we all elected to that some people were just kind of put into in a way, like it was a core 105 class. So when other people were taking it, they were just kind of choosing a random one to fulfill a credit. But I think that it was really meaningful that we all chose this one class that we were all really interested in and that we even chose to live with the people like on the same floor and stuff that we were interested in the same topics and same kind of topic umbrella and so that was really helpful to just know that the person next door to you had some sort of similar interest so when I was first making connections with people on my floor it was really helpful to have one jumping off point just asking what class in the university college they were in or why they chose that class. And so it was really helpful, I think, for me to have an academic kind of connecting point because I know that in some classes, like in a math class, it's a little harder because you all have to take a math class. You can't just be like, oh, why'd you take math 125? It's because, oh, you, you have to. So it's nice to have an academic point that you all can kind of congregate together with. It gives you that in, right? That sort of, you know, um... You know, I hate walking into a room of people I don't know and trying to make small talk at a party, right? My my introvert tendencies do not work there. So having that shared connection, yeah. And we see that right across our living learning communities. That's that's what a lot of our students say is it's it's a way to find friends early on. Yeah. Yeah. Stevie, did you have a thought? Yeah, I would say that like clubs are a big thing. I honestly think that joining clubs can be really scary initially. Um 
I was like not a club person, but then I had like somebody who I had one class with like make a big deal and be like, come try out for the improv troupe. It's going to be so fun. Like, come do it. You're funny. Like, blah, blah, blah. And I went and I got on and like, I'm pretty much friends with every single person on the troupe. And so like, since then I've started joining more clubs. I was like, okay, this isn't that serious. But I think that like, I don't know the best way for faculty or TAs or advisors to go about encouraging people to join clubs, but like joining clubs is the way to go because the worst that can happen is you join the club and you get to week two and you're like, I'm leaving the club and nothing happens. No one's mad at you. Like people are happy you came, happy you tried it out. And so like the tabling events, et cetera, like making a big deal, like go to the tables, go meet people, go to a meeting, stuff like that. How about you, Sean? How did I see you echoing? But how how did you find community at AU? So I also, um, like CV, really uh, was kind of averse to joining clubs when I when I started at AU. Um, I didn't want to do it. I was like, I'd rather just sit in my dorm room and hang out with the friends that I already have. But then um, I eventually, one of my friends convinced me um, that Greek life at AU was something that I would actually be interested in. Um, so I actually, I went out and uh, went to a couple of Rush events and I really liked uh, the people in one of the, one of the fraternities and I ended up rushing and that definitely really helped. I, I made a lot of good connections. Um, I, I felt like I had some mentors at the school, um, some people who like could help me figure out what to do when I was struggling with classes or going to online school um, rather than uh, in person. Uh, and that, that was, that was huge for me. I think, uh, I think, Personally, and I know it's a little bit controversial, but I, I really enjoyed Greek life. Yeah, definitely forms that community. Um, there are some great questions in the chat that um, going back to some of the questions about TAs. Um, and, you know, one question is, we've talked a lot about freedom of expression and academic standards in the classroom. Have you had any classroom experiences where the discussion got out of hand? Um, and was there anything useful a faculty member or um, a TA can do in those moments? So, you know, talking about controversial issues, really tough issues in the classroom, um, and discussions can get heated. What have you appreciated that a faculty member or a TA has done to manage that and to bring other views in, um, in your experiences? Yeah, Gabby. Um, in one of my government classes, we were discussing kind of issues in different organizations and how they can be better. And one of the people in my class brought in a point and kind of came down on a very large not-for-profit organization in the United States that was for like a social justice issue. And we were kind of discussing it and he was really coming down hard on it and talking about all the issues with it. And I could tell that people in the classroom are kind of disagreeing with it. And I kind of stepped out of my comfort zone. I do not like to argue in class. I like to talk in class, but I don't like to have a argumentative kind of conversation in class. But I kind of went out and I was like, these are the issues that you're talking about. And these are the holes that I'm seeing in that. And I was really worried that my teacher was gonna be upset that I kind of went back at the student. And I didn't go back at the student in a hurtful way. I didn't go at any of his, you know, ideas specifically that were him and about his identities. And so I was hoping that the teacher would kind of see where I was coming from and on the other side of the argument. And I was very happy that she was able to say there, there's truth in both of these statements and one of you is not completely correct and the other is not completely wrong. And it was helpful that she kind of validated both of us and congratulated us on kind of having that sort of conversation that's so frequently frowned upon to kind of go back and forth with a student in the class. And so I was happy that it was kind of welcomed and appreciated and she made it all so the entire class was able to learn from that, the points that we both made. Congratulations on doing that. I mean, that that's hard, right? That's a hard skill to learn and hard to do in the moment. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you, know, you were able to find your voice in that moment and engage in that way. Um, such good modeling for our other students. Nice job. Um, Andrea. I think something helpful that one of my professors did in a class that I took uh, last year was before we even started doing discussions about topics, uh, was she kind of outlined her expectations for what should happen in a discussion and um, how to be respectful of people's opinions. 
whether or not you agree with it, because no matter what, we come from all different kinds of places, all different kinds of walks of life. So kind of understanding that not everybody's going to think the same way as you and not everybody's going to have the same opinions and going about um, any sort of discussion in a respectful way where everybody can be heard without feeling like they're being attacked uh, or without feeling like they're wrong. Everybody else is like coming down on them. All those are extremely important. Stevie. I would say that if you are a professor or a TA or whatever that like actually tries to, you know, sort of get a sense of a bond with your students, you can typically tell when a conversation has gone too far in quotes, because you can feel like the tenseness spread. You can feel people like feeling upset, looking upset, being mad, kind of having certain body language that's kind of like trying to turn them away from the conversation or as if they're like stands up for lack of a better word. And I think like when it gets to those points, you might want to be like, okay, I'll hear one other person, but otherwise we're going to have to stop because I can tell that people are uncomfortable. Because the reality is like, even if those people are really passionate about the subject, you don't want everybody to be uncomfortable. Two people, two, three, four people wanting to have a conversation, but 15 other people not wanting to have it. Sometimes you have to be biased towards like, we're going to move past this. That's interesting. Like this, this question of being uncomfortable in the classroom, um, you know, so you know, what's the line between feeling safe in the classroom and feeling uncomfortable? Because, you know, I would argue in some circumstances, we should be uncomfortable in the classroom, right? We, we need to be brave enough to do that. Um, that's a space that we can learn in. But there is a line where a student, a student or a TA or a faculty member might not feel safe. Um, do you all have thoughts on that? And I think there's a good question in the chat that relates to this. Um, you know, what's the responsibility of faculty to distinguish fact from opinion? And how can you do that um, in a way that leads to productive conversation? So I'm, I'm curious about this idea of like, do we when do we stop discussion? And Regina, you may have a thought too. You've been doing so much around freedom of expression on campus. So do you have something to add before we let our students chime in on that? I'd be glad to kind of hear what they say. And then I'm happy to bring in some conversation we had in one of the previous sessions. Okay, great. Um, Desiree and then Stevie. I think it depends on the topic. Um, because I feel like topics more around race and like sexual orientation are much more sensitive than like if we're arguing about something in science. Um, and to make a point of, of what you said, the difference between fact and opinion, I learned in my freshman AUX class that facts are different depending on where you were raised and what you're taught like in your textbooks. Um, because I found out in that class that what I was being taught in New York, someone down south was being taught a totally different side of history. So I don't really know how to answer that question because it's very difficult. Um, but in my experience with teachers, like when things got out of hand, they did just bring it back in and just change the topic. Um, I know in trainings for RHA, they give a disclaimer that if something is sensitive, you're allowed to leave the room. But I think that in an educational setting, they, that might not be the best sometimes because we need to learn the content. So I don't really have any suggestions, but that's what I experienced. And those are my little points that I can make. Yeah, Desiree, I'd love to hear more about, um, you know, when you, when you realized that some of the things that you were being taught as fact and some of the things that other students were being taught as fact differed based on geographical region and your um, circumstance. Um, how did you how did you square all that? You know, how did um how did that discussion go in class? Um, I feel like personally I kind of like disappeared, like just confused in my mind. Like I just stepped out of the class for a minute mentally. I was still physically there, but I was just like, wow, that's crazy. Um, and then I didn't say much in the class. I just went home and spoke to it with my family members. Because mm -hmm. um, being at AU, sometimes I feel not, not out of place, but sometimes I'm, well, I am the minority. So there's certain topics that I personally don't speak up about in class. Um, and being a freshman, it was very uncomfortable for me to speak or want to argue on that type of topic. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just was like, wow. And that was it. Yeah. Was, yeah. So found other places to engage. Yeah. 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 Do you think that 
do you think there would have been value in the discussion continuing in the class? Like, is there something the professor could have done or anything to make that feel more doable? Um, there were people that argued. Yeah. But that just wasn't me at the time. I'm not Fair a here in the classroom. So it wasn't like it was uncomfortable for everyone to voice their opinion. It was just for me. And that's yeah. Yep, fair. Yep. And sometimes you got to do that, right? Draw your own boundaries. Sure. Um, Stevie, I think you had a thought. Something in terms of safety and discomfort is that I think a big thing that I had a professor do was explicitly say, if you are going to talk about something, you need to talk about it with evidence. And she was like, your evidence can be you had an experience, but you have to say, I had an experience where, or you had to be like, I saw, saw this, blah, 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 blah. She was like, or if you want to say you read something, you have to say you read something on X site. Because she was like, you can't, she was like, that's going to be the way that I'm going to differentiate between what we can say to each other and what we can't, because you can't just make things up. You can't just like decide that you disagree with the textbook, but for no particular reason. There has to be like a reason behind these conversations we're having together. And then the other thing that I want to say about, you know, being uncomfortable, I think that being uncomfortable can be helpful because sometimes that's how you grow. But I think there's a time where you can be like, not only are these people uncomfortable, they literally feel like unsafe. And I think that's something, I'm probably pushing it, but something that I think that a lot of times faculty try to do is make all of their students friends when the reality is like, not everybody can be friends and that's fine. Like, it, that doesn't mean anybody has to hate each other, anybody has to fight, anybody has to have like beef, but like not everybody can be friends because not everybody's compatible. And so I think that sometimes students feel uncomfortable when they have a disagreement with the student and then the faculty tries to be like, okay, you guys need to make up, you guys need to do a group project together, something to make it up. And it's like, if we can be comfortably not friends, that usually ends up resulting in a much better relationship than you trying to force us to be friends. Thanks, Stevie. I was like, I want to acknowledge a couple of things that were sort of said in here that I think were said in previous spaces. One, um, you know, to kind of synthesize what you all were, were saying, I think there's real value in faculty acknowledging when we disagree well, right? And so like Gabby, to the point you were making, I think Stevie and Desiree, this is aligned with you all too, like when there is able to be disagreement that isn't personal, right? That isn't attacking, um, but is really about ideas and is really about, you know, facts, factual disagreements, um, calling that out, recognizing that, emphasizing that. Um, and I've heard that in a lot of the spaces um, that uh, we've been having various conversations around freedom of expression. I, I was able to co-chair that um, working group this past year with Tom Merrill and SPA um, is, is really finding ways to acknowledge when we do it well um, and, and not to avoid, which I think is another sort of aspect of that that I'm also sort of hearing in some of you all is like, you know, what can happen is when things start to get uncomfortable is to want to just avoid it entirely, which could either allow the conversation to go on too long when it shouldn't, right? Um, you know, that's one sort of possible pitfall of it. Um, or uh, setting up a scenario where there's stuff that actually should be resolved for the factual uh, substance of the class that doesn't get resolved because, you know, it just felt easier to sort of avoid in that moment. So those are some of the things that I think have been coming up in a lot of the conversations we're having. And I really appreciate you all lifting up various aspects um, of that, right? Uh, and Andrea as well, I think we've had a lot of conversations about if you know you're teaching a class that's going to bring up some tough topics, really acknowledge that on day one, right? Don't wait until, uh, you know, we're already into that discussion, but setting uh, setting the stage well. So yeah, I, I think you all have hit on themes that I felt like I've heard from various students and faculty throughout the course of the year. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to bring in one of the other questions um, from the chat. Uh, I think this has come up in various conversations we've had as well. Uh, from a new faculty member, could you describe um, what has been the balance in your classes between an emphasis on grades and an emphasis on learning? And do you feel the pressure to focus on getting the highest grade possible? Do you wish it were different? Uh, this just feels like it hits the nail on the head for some of the AU community. So I'd love to hear our students' thoughts um, on that as well. Yeah, Stevie. Okay, so this is coming from a homeschooled person throughout high school, full disclosure. 
Um, but when it comes to the balance between grades and learning, I think that's something that, sh that is often helpful to me, especially, but also students in general, is that like, we can learn whatever you're going to teach us. Like, we're not incapable of things. We actually want to know it. We like, that's why we're there. We're there to want to know it. Um, we picked that major because we want to know it. We picked your class because we want to know it. And so like the goal for everyone is to get a good grade. And so I think when it comes to the balance, it's about what the personal faculty is going to emphasize. Are you guys going to be transparent and be like, this might be on a test? Or are you going to be like, this isn't going to be on a test, but I think it's really quality for you to know. And if you don't know if it's going to be on a test or not, you can be like, well, we'll see how this today's discussion goes. And if I feel you guys really comprehend it, then I'll put it on the test for like some easy going back to it. Or I'll be like, I feel you guys really understood. We don't need to go back over it with a test, um, things like that. Or like if it comes to tests in general, something that's been really helpful is when they do test recaps. So like, I know if you do a test on Canva, you can see how what percent of people got a certain question wrong. So like if 50% of your class got a question wrong, it's usually helpful if you go back over and you're like, this can benefit your grade because this is the kind of question this is. This is what most people got wrong. And then on top of that, now you know the content better because we went over this question. So like things like that are usually really helpful in facilitating that balance. Awesome, thanks Stevie. Um, yeah, Gabby. I think one thing that I think is more helpful that I think really relates to high school is that in high school, a lot of my teachers would talk about grades in class. How many people got A's? How many people got B's? And I've had some teachers in college do that, but then when you're the person who got one of three B's and everyone else got an A or one, you know, something like that, it makes you feel like, oh, is, like, is this even worth trying because I'm so far behind everyone and clearly everyone gets this more than me and it just kind of makes you feel down on yourself. But I think when teachers, rather than discussing grades or how many people did well on this or how many people struggled with this is talking about where everyone or the majority of people were struggling thematically or on one certain part, like, if you're in a government class and everyone's kind of struggling with the analysis or everyone's struggling with the evidential piece, talking about that rather than saying, well, so-and-so, like this many people got an A, so clearly they understand everything. They're not gonna understand everything. I think it's a lot more helpful when professors discuss more about the themes in the essay or the assignment or something like that rather than the actual number or letter grade. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of visual agreement there as well. Um, Andrea. I think going off of Gabby's point, um, something that's really helpful that some professors do is instead of um, making assignments for students that have a big emphasis on the grade that you get, it's more just a way to show your learning. So things like a reflection um, that's maybe like 2% of your grade in the long run. So it doesn't really affect anything um, and it's more just a completion aspect, but being able to show what you've learned um, and how you're applying that to uh, like real life, for instance, is very helpful in a way to show that you are in fact learning something, but uh, you're not focusing so much on like, I need to make this absolutely perfect because I need to get that A. Have any of you had, um, so in AUX, for example, we've experimented with self-assessment where students can, you know, they're self-assessing as the semester goes on and consulting with the faculty member um, around the grades for individual assignments and reflecting on the work. Have any of you had experiences where faculty are engaging in non-traditional grading? And did it work? Did it not work? And I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if any of you had. Yeah, Gabby. In my first semester, I had a class that was labor-based grading, which was my first ever touch into any of that. I'd never heard of it before that class. I'd never, in the since then, I've had never had any labor-based grading in any of my other classes. And it was really interesting. The only issue that I really felt with it was that I was putting like my all into the class. And then at the end, I was feeling like I didn't know how I actually absorb the material because even if I I tried my hardest on an assignment and I tried to use what we were learning about the teacher would still give me a 100 because I put a lot of effort into it but I might not have understood the material so I felt like in that sense labor-based grading I wasn't able to get the same amount of feedback and that might have just been like the teachers like on the teacher but I felt like with labor-based grading it was a lot harder to kind of understand how well I was absorbing the material or understanding it. 
Yeah, and Gabby, a bunch of people might not have, may have never heard of labor-based grading. How did you understand it? Um, how did you understand that sort of philosophy? To me, labor-based grading, at least from what I learned from a professor, was just you earn the grade of the work that you put in. So if you're handing in a half written essay, you're going to get like a 50% or 70% or something like that. But if you, the teacher feels like objectively you put in 100% of your effort, you're getting the full grade that you could get. So all 100 out of 100. And so a lot of people ended up earning, if they turned in every single one of their assignments, they got a 100 in the class. If they turned in 70% of the assignments, they got a 70 or something like that. And then there was like one assignment at the end that could, if you didn't have a A, bump you up to an A. And if you had an A, it would keep you at an A. So that was kind of what I got from the semester of that. Would you want to do it again? In some aspects, I had teachers who did it more of like not labor-based, but completion-based and then gave a lot of feedback. And then we also had tests and essays that were graded with a number letter grade. And so I feel like that worked better for me just because I felt like I could see how well I was learning the material or how well I understood the assignment. And even if it was completion-based on a couple things, I felt like it was still easier to see how I was absorbing the material, which worked better for me. Because I think even if I gave 100% and got a 95 with a lot of comments and saw, oh, I need to focus on this for the next essay or for the next assignment, it worked better than, it felt better than getting 100, even if I did it all completely wrong. Anyone else have experiences with different forms of grading? Any of our students? Okay. Okay. I think Stevie might be frozen. <laughs> yeah, Stevie's frozen. I think, yeah, okay. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was raising my hand. Oh, we're losing you, Stevie. Yeah, Stevie, we're losing you. Okay. Um, one thing that we asked um, this group of students a couple uh, earlier this week was, you know, we have very often in the administration counseled faculty to give assignments in the first week, a couple weeks of class, so that students would have an idea how they're doing before ad drop or before the chance to withdraw or before the chance to change a cl uh, class to pass fail. Um, and we're wondering what students' reactions to that is, because we've heard mixed things. Um, we've heard some students love that and some students hate it. And I'm wondering from the students on this call, is that helpful for your faculty to give an assignment um, in those first two or three weeks of class? Thoughts on that? Sean, what do you think? Uh, um, I, I prefer when um, professors give a small assignment within the first couple of weeks to give some some idea of what uh, the class is going to look like um though i've i've had the opposite experience where um, professors might give a really heavy assignment within the first couple of weeks um and that uh, that can be a little bit challenging especially if um a couple other classes are doing the same thing so i think as long as uh the assignment is a good indicator of what the class is going to be like it doesn't necessarily need to be a really heavy assignment but I think it, it can definitely help um, figure out what the rest of the semester is going to look like. And I can plan out my time based on when assignments are scheduled and how hard I, th I think those assignments are going to be based on the first few weeks of the class. Andrea, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree um, with you, Sean. I think that having a sort of low stakes assignment the first couple of weeks just to kind of gauge what the professor expects from you is very helpful, um, as well as just to see if you grasp the class material or if you maybe need to uh, like tweak your study habits. Um, but it's not helpful if it's like a giant paper or something where you haven't been given a lot of guidance and you maybe don't know that much about the class just yet um, and you don't really understand what the professor expects of you. That's not super helpful. <laughs> Stevie. Um, I'm echoing what they said and also adding that like 
I think something that's been helpful is when we have an assignment at the beginning, if it's going to be an assignment that's basically going to be like done throughout the semester. So if we're doing reflections at the end of every month and we're, you're going to open with a reflection at the beginning, tell us what it's supposed to look like. You know, give us a real rundown of it so that we can be like, we can accomplish this every couple of weeks. We can really do this, you know, every other day, whatever it is, like, you know, give us a real introduction. Like, this is really serious. You're going to have to do this a couple of times. This is what it looks like because like we're doing a trial run. Like, you know, up until the ad job is over, we're just doing a little trial run. So give us that 30 day trial and then we'll be like, this is fun, I can do this. And then like, we'll probably stay in the class if we feel like you're there to actually help us understand what every assignment is supposed to be. Okay, so I hear low stakes assignments, but being really clear so that um, there's a roadmap of how an assignment's to be done and that can really help later on in the semester as well. Yeah, okay. Regina, did you have a next question? Yeah, oh, with the, you know, there's a follow up in the chat. Um, oh. Yeah, about this exact issue. So um, can you guys provide an example of an easier low stakes assignment or a hard assignment in the first couple of weeks? Like what what would be a good one? Steve, your hand went right up. What do you think? <laughs> and then Desiree. I had a professor um, have us write not an outline that was supposed to be four pages long with bulletin and sub bulletins. I didn't know anything about the topic enough to do that. That is an assignment where if I don't have the materials yet, please don't assign it to me. It's not gonna be good. And then I'm gonna feel bad turning it in. Um, <laughs> that's just like, I'm gonna be like, I don't have the information to do this. Um, for an easy assignment though, that's something where it's like, I've kind of given you guys, you know, two, three lessons. They were about, I'm just going to make something up. They were about, we read a chapter on prison life, or we previewed a chapter on prison life with a PowerPoint. So everybody in the class should know the general gist of prison life. I want you to write two pages on your opinions about the good and bad parts of prison life. That's something where it's like, it's so easy. Um, maybe you have like, you know, formatting preferences. Um, really specific questions about prison life, like maybe you want to make a really, really specific. Stevie, we're losing you again, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to Desiree. Yeah, Desiree. Um, from my experience, readings and then like writing a memo or a reflection, I would consider easy assignment. That's where I'm going. Okay, I learned this. I know, I know it. I know that this part of the textbooks. Hey, Stevie, we're, you're going in and out. So if you could mute for a minute, that'd be great. Um, Desiree, go ahead. Sorry. So like, um, yeah, so readings and then a memo. And then if there's like a Canva assignment or something that's already made in the, in the system, like through the textbooks, if it could just be graded a little less, that way it's like, this is the real work that you would do, but this time it's not graded at the same percentage as it will be graded moving forward. Getting old sound, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, Stevie. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. Desiree, did you finish your sleep? Yes. If yes. everyone heard me and it was clear, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, it was very clear. Okay. Other people have thoughts on the low stakes assignments versus not. Uh, Andrea. And something helpful in my psychology classes, the professor might assign um, like a pretty easy to read um, article written like in a journal or something, and then have it kind of be a reflection, kind of say like what we thought of the article, um, maybe some little take that we found in the article, um, as well as connecting it to the um, And then it's just, and then we'll go into class, whatever time is the next session, and then we'll just kind of discuss it as a class and kind of hear, maybe if we didn't understand the article, the professor will explain it in more detail. Um, or we'll hear someone's perspective from the class about what they thought of it. Um, so just kind of taking like your ideas and sharing them out and then hearing what other people have to say, uh, which gives you like a better idea of what to expect both from the subjects in the class as well as just that specific paper in general. 
Thank you all. That's helpful. Um, question I wanted to ask you all is, uh, you know, our faculty and our staff are here to support you all and to help you. What is a really practical thing that a faculty or a staff member has said or has done that has made you feel like that is someone I can approach or that is uh, an office I want to go to um, or whatever? Just anything that really stood out to you is like that made me feel like I could go there or ask that question. Yeah, Desiree. From personal experience, I like when my professors are personable, um, not for them to get too personal in class, but when you feel like they are human too. And like when you go to them, they'll be they'll be real, not like, you know, not when you think of college and you think of a professor, it's very intimidating and scary. But when a professor is like open, they make jokes, little things in class that keep us engaged and make it seem like we're comfortable enough to go to them to ask questions and use them as a resource. Thank you. Yeah, Gabby. Kind of jumping off of Desiree's point, just like also if they're able to laugh at their mistakes in class, like if they slip up on their words and then can laugh on it and like admit that they just messed up or slipped up, it kind of makes it easier if you slip up in class, you're like, okay, the teacher's not just like hard, like super strict and everything and has a, has a face behind or has a personality behind the face and stuff like that. And also one specific thing is in the beginning of last semester, I was really struggling in one of my classes, just did not understand the material. And I went to office hours and I was just completely honest with the professor. And I could tell that she really appreciated that I was honest and really was looking out for me the rest of the semester and helped me kind of walk through where I was messing up and where I wasn't understanding how to get through the reading and then also made it a point in class to not make it feel like it was an attack on me or anything but explain how to get through the reading if people were struggling and other people in the class were saying that was helpful and they were also struggling but didn't say anything and then throughout the semester on all of my papers or things that I was turning in I could see that she remembered that I was trying hard to understand and using what she had told me to better understand the readings and so she would comment on that and so just being understanding when people come to you and say, I don't understand anything, not just because I've had teachers who say, well, what are you confused about? And sometimes you don't know what you're confused about. You just are generally confused about the material. So understanding that sometimes just being confused is a question enough and not having to kind of articulate your thoughts when you don't even understand. Uh, I'm still definitely seeing some agreement among your fellow students here. I have a vivid memory from like a high school chemistry class where you would have to, and there's a reason I did not go into the, to the sciences, um, you know, you, there will be certain constant numbers that you insert in formulas to get to, you know, the answer to whatever the question was. And I remember the teacher used this, you know, constant number. And I said, well, wait, I don't understand. Like, why did you use that number? And she turned to me looked me dead in the eyes and she said, well, Ms. Waters, what would you have used? I was like, I have no idea. But I was so scared to ask a question in that class afterwards because I felt dumb, right? I felt like I shouldn't have asked that and everyone else knows how to use this number and I don't know why on earth she used this number. So I hear that. I hear that, Gabby. Sometimes it's just confusion. Like what the heck is happening? Yeah. Um, Stevie, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And you worried. didn't. Can you hear me well? Sorry, Stevie. No, we're not. We're, maybe you could put something in the chat, Stevie. In the chat. Awesome. Andrea or Sean, anything to add to just like practical? Tips? Okay, I will. Yeah, I will. Yeah, Andrea. Um, sorry, could you reframe the question one more time? Yeah. So um, a time when you had a faculty or staff member like do or say something that made you feel like you could approach them or you could follow up or feel welcome in their space. Yeah, I think one of the most helpful things is having a professor who um, says like, I know that this is kind of a confusing topic, like please come to my office hours and we'll talk this through. Like, I promise I'm not scary, I'm not gonna bite. Um, I was once a college student myself. I understand how terrifying it can be to go to someone's office and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so just kind of like opening that dialogue um, as well as I think it was freshman year, we had a, an AUX assignment where we had to go to a professor and we had to like fill out this little 
assignment afterwards um all about like how we went to office hours and we talked about whatever came to mind and I had never gone to office hours before that moment uh and then after I finally did it for the first time I realized hey that was a real person that I just talked to that wasn't bad at all um and I started going like very 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 often um and it helped me to get a better sense of what it's like to take a college class that first semester. Thank you. Sean. Yeah, um, I, my personal favorite professor at AU, um, I, I think the, the thing that really set him apart for me was um, he was, he, he felt like a human, like he felt like I, I he explained what he did before uh, being at AU on the first day. He told a lot of personal stories and then one day when I was walking out of class, walking to my apartment building, he was walking in the same direction and he went out of his way to ask me how I felt the class was going, ask me what I wanted to do after college, gave me some advice about um, my career, just out of out of just being, uh, being a nice person. Um, and I think we were able to really form a connection after that. And he invited me uh, back to take uh, one of his, um, he, he teaches the the real estate investment trust uh, which is um, it's a student class where the students uh, manage a part of the endowment um, and I really I, that was one of the most um, rewarding experiences I've had at AU uh, and I think if if he hadn't reached out to me and been been uh, very outgoing and very um, just very personal um, I, I think I would have never um, considered doing the real estate investment trust and I think that just being a human and really um, trying to connect with your students, I think is is huge. That's great. Thank you. Um, great. Just follow on question in the chat. Do you all have a preference or do you find one more accessible than the other to sort of have open set office hours or by appointment? Do you all have any strong feelings um, on that topic? Yeah, Andrea. I think either one is fine, although if there's like a set time that office hours always happen and a student has um, like a class conflict and can't show up, having um, available time outside of those hours for those students is helpful. Um, and then as far as like appointment office hours, um, there was one professor that I had that had appointment office hours and then would never show up for the appointments. So just making sure to actually show up for the appointment office hours to make sure that they're actually helpful. Um, but other than that, either one is fine. I've never really had an issue with either. Awesome. Show to your appointments. Feels like always a good tip uh, for any of us. Excellent. Gabby? I think that sometimes off regular office hours where they're just at a certain time are a little bit more approachable because I feel like I'm using the professor's time that they've kind of slotted out for us. And also I like when other students are there because it makes me feel like I'm maybe not the only one who's really confused or someone else will ask a question. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize like I should be worried or I should be thinking about that or I didn't know that I didn't know that either and stuff like that. And so I like when other students are there to kind of share the office hours in a way. And I feel like sometimes having to schedule an appointment with a professor can kind of feel more direct and like more intense, I guess, more intimidating, I would say for me at least. And so I like when there are other students there who are able to kind of share the office hours and kind of bounce ideas around that we're confused about or wondering about. Okay, so we're getting to sort of the end of our time and Regina, I'm happy to throw out one last question. Yeah, okay. so. You know, we said we titled this this thing. What what students wish faculty and staff would know. So here is your chance. Um, give us one thing that you wish faculty and staff would know. One tip. One piece of advice. Um, I'll, I'll throw it open to you, Andrea. I see you nodding. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What would, what would you say? I would say probably one of the biggest things is we have lives outside of school we're taking more than one class and that being their class um, a lot of students have other jobs other commitments other internships maybe multiple jobs um, so just kind of um, understanding that we're wanted in more than one place um, and being 
understanding of that is very helpful from the professor. You were all full on humans with human things. Absolutely. Yeah. Desiree, what would you say? Um, to add on to that, especially after COVID, I think moving and thinking with compassion, um, because a lot of people's mental state has been affected since COVID, um, is we're still kind of recovering. Uh, yeah, so just compassion and and having grace, like giving students grace. I love that, Desiree. And can like, what's an example? What would that look like? Do you have a something in your head about like what a manifestation of that grace or compassion would look like? I think if something could be expressed in the beginning, like I'm here for you guys. If anything comes up, let me know. Um, and just being understanding when hiccups do come up. Like during COVID, I experienced death in a family um, during online schooling, but my teachers were very open and understanding and they worked with me um, and everybody's different like some people can bounce back quicker than others so just you know understanding that everyone's different and as long as you see some effort acknowledge that and like encourage us that we are doing well and the same way we should encourage our teachers like thank you professor um, we appreciate you being here you've given us your time and just having that two-way street of encouragement and positivity in the classroom or even outside of it. Thanks for sharing that, Desiree. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, but I, I like this idea of the two-way going back and forth and, and showing that grace both ways. I like that a lot. Um, let's see, uh, Gabby. I think in terms of in the classroom, sometimes if people, if the whole class doesn't want to participate, that may be a sign that that's on the teacher, that they haven't fostered an environment where people don't want to talk. If it's completely cold calling, or even if it's raising hands, I think it's a sign that the teacher hasn't, or professor hasn't fostered an environment where people feel open to talk. And every time that someone raises their hand, it's them kind of being vulnerable, even if it's something very basic. I think it's still hard and I'm very extroverted and I still struggle with raising my hand in class. And so I think that having professors that understand that any contribution from anyone is still kind of difficult and still puts people out there and for other people to see what they're thinking. And so it's still a very vulnerable position to be in. So to be not just thankful, but like understand that if people aren't talking, that's not that they always don't understand it's sometimes that they don't feel comfortable raising their hand and they can maybe show it in other ways or just work on creating a classroom environment where people feel safe to just say I don't really understand what we're doing can you go over this one part more I love that framing of like just raising your hand or contributing as an act of vulnerability um that really that really resonates I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that one away that is a good nugget um, let's see, Sean and then Stevie. Yeah, so um, kind of to follow up on the, the two-way street uh, thing, I think um, I wish there was an easier way to let professors know um, when when you think they're doing a, a really good job, because I think there's there's a few professors that uh, I, uh, I really want them to know that I, I enjoy their class, but I don't want them to think I'm emailing them to improve my grade or um, to have better luck with their classes in the future. Um, so I think if there's an easier way to give them feedback that is, uh, I, and I, I don't I don't really have a tangible solution for this um, aside from just the anonymous reviews, but I think there, there are some professors that I, I think deserve a, a lot of recognition. Um, and that's, that's honestly been one of my favorite parts about being at AU is, uh, I've, I've just had incredible experiences with the professors here. So I think if there's a way to do that, that would be great. I can't personally think of a solution, but uh, yeah. We need to have like an anonymous, you know, kudos to professor boards or something, but because I hear you, like you can do it in the end of the year evaluations, but does it seem like you're, you know, trying to curry favor if you say something positive to the professor? I will tell you as someone who has been in the classroom for a long time, 
it's always so nice to get some form of positive feedback. And, you know, I, I think professors are pretty good at, at sussing out what's genuine and what's not. So, yeah. And Stevie, last but not least. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, I was gonna say, I just wanna like, we, we as students, we get tired. Sometimes it's like something that's not even related to class that has happened, but like we get tired, things happen. And a lot of times a whole class will get tired at one time. I've had professors who will be like, how's everybody feeling? And the people are like, I'm fine. And it's like, no, but like, do you feel tired? Because sometimes that professor is like, let's just take a break. We'll do a half day next time we meet so that people can like go home, get some rest. We'll not meet that day. We'll do an online session that day. Just like allowing students to be candid about how they feel. Because a lot of times like we get so tired, but we feel like we can't say anything. And so then like our next assignment is like half done, things like that. Um, and also on the topic of being treating us with care, I had someone also die during COVID, but uh, we were in person class and I had to leave. And I had a professor ask me, they were like, mm, can you show me proof that person died or that you're close to that person? And I was like, and I was like, um, that's kind of rude. I mean, I'm not making it up. I have to leave. Like I have to leave to go to this funeral. And I students aren't usually lying and if we're lying it's usually for a good reason that's pretty much just where I'm going with that sort of thing and so like there we have we have methods to our madness and we promise we're not trying to disrespect you so that's kind of just something that I think is a big thing awesome thank you Stevie um and if I can just add something from our side of the house um you know as someone who spent the majority of my career kind of doing accountability stuff uh I still like to lead with trust and respect and human compassion um and you know and I think that's cool um but remind everyone too that uh always offering resources to students would be helpful right like the dean of students office is a resource to help students get documented excused absences but also just get connected with other resources that they need. And so, you know, an option could be responding to a student who's sharing that they're navigating a death in the family or a significant illness or other things to connect them with the Dean Student's Office. Um, and then the Dean Student's Office can provide that appropriate follow-up and support um, and if needed, documentation, right? Um, so especially for our new faculty members here, I just wanna emphasize that as a great resource. Um, and I think that's one of the other things that we can all really do to be helpful is just kind of increase our knowledge of um, the university. Like I always like to think about like, if I don't know the answer or if I'm not the right person, I wanna get you to exactly who is um, and not just sort of send you on a wild goose chase around like, well, maybe try over there, or like maybe call clear. Um, so I just want to thank our students so much for being willing to join in this conversation um, and to be so candid. I know I've definitely taken um, away, you know, a lot from um, from this session, and I hope you all have too. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Stevie did drop an earlier uh, comment in the in the chat as well. So just to answer one of the previous questions um, and encourage you all to do the survey, but. Thank you again so much for taking the time to really hear from our students in this way um, and really just give them some appreciation for uh, being willing to share with us. So thank you all so much.